Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, our eighth, I believe, our eighth session on the tafsir of Surah Al Anbiya. And we left off uh, at uh, verse number 30, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have those who disbelieve not considered that the heavens and the earth were sewn together? and we rent them asunder, and we made every living thing from water, will they not then believe? If you recall, my dear brothers and sisters, in our last session, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially refuted the notion of multiple gods, and he established through logical argumentation, the existence of one creator. And we spoke about what the universe would look like if there were more than one God. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us to reflect on his creation as a way to appreciate his greatness, as a way for us to derive spiritual nourishment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the in the next few verses, he's going to speak about creation. He wants us to reflect on the, the origins of the universe, the blessings that he has scattered throughout the universe. So a lot of the verses that we're going to be discussing, especially this particular verse, deals with the topic of cosmology. So there's this invitation to reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth. Now, when you think about nature, when you think about the universe, Muslims and non-Muslims alike both marvel at the beauty of creation. Even an atheist will marvel at the intricacy, the complexity, and the mind-boggling organization that is seen in the world of creation. But the problem is that most people are in awe of creation, but they fail to make the connection, to take it one step further and appreciate the greatness of the one who created this marvelous system. You know, it's, it's, it's comparable to someone, you know, looking at, the Mona Lisa, and not even mentioning the artist. So human beings have this tendency where, you know, we'll, we'll marvel at how beautiful the sunset is. We'll talk about how vast the universe is, how intricate it is, how intricate these, these, uh, these creatures and these organisms are. We'll marvel at these, uh, these natural phenomenons, but we won't make that, that connection we won't think about the greatness, the omnipotence of the creator. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially inviting us to be in awe of his creation, but to be in more awe of the creator. So Allah says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Allah is specifically speaking, addressing the disbelievers. Almost rebuking them you know Allah is done with logical refutation that the argument has been won here Allah is rebuking them don't you see don't the disbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were that they were sewn together or they were one mass, one entity, and we rent them asunder. Now, again, we've mentioned this in, in our other tafsir sessions, but the word kufr literally means to conceal, to conceal something, to hide something. And in classical Arabic, farmers, because farmers one of the most important jobs of a farmer is that farmers sow seeds in the ground. And because a farmer buries the seeds in the ground, 
In classical Arabic, a farmer is called kafir because of the act of covering up the seed with dirt. Now, there are many people who see the signs of God. And the problem with them is that their rejection of the truth is not based on lack of knowledge. Meaning that they don't reject God because they don't know or they're not able to make the connection. So the problem is not insufficient knowledge. It's not an epistemological issue. Rather, the problem is it, there's a moral problem. Oftentimes it's arrogance. Because arrogance can blind someone. It can make someone delusional. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Don't the, the disbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were sewn together. كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا Now the word ratq in the Arabic language is similar to the word fatq. So Allah says, كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا So there are two words that are being used. ratq and fatq, right? Now, what's the difference? Now, it's very tempting to look at this verse and think about the Big Bang Theory. It's very tempting to do that. But let me share with you an explanation that was given by Imam al-Baqir on this particular verse. So the word, before we get to the hadith of Imam al-Baqir, the word rat also means something that is closed. Something that's closed. Something that's closed. And fat is to split something open, to open. So rat means something that's closed, some singular thing that's closed. And fat is to open. Now, so what does it mean when Allah says the heavens and the earth were in a state of ratq, they were closed, and then Allah opened both of them. There's a narration from Imam al-Baqir where the Imam was asked, he was asked about this particular verse. And the Imam salam, he explains, and if, and if you look at the rest of the ayah, it, it makes perfect sense. The Imam says, كانت السماء رتقا. The Imam says the meaning of the heavens, the sky being closed, being in a state of ratq, لا تنزل المطر. That it means that it, there was no rain falling from the sky. So it was closed. The sky was closed. Meaning that there was a time in the, in the earth's history where there was no rainfall. وَكَانَتِ الْأَرْضُ رَتْقًا لَا تَنْبُتُ الْحَبْ Imam al-Baqir says, and there was a time when the earth was in a state of ratq, meaning the earth was closed, meaning that it did not, the earth did not split with vegetation, with plants, with foliage. فَلَمَّا, the Imam says, فَلَمَّا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ الْخَلْقِ When Allah created creation, وَبَثَّ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ دَابَ And when He ordained that He was going to create living organisms on this earth, there are two things that Allah did to prepare for life on earth. Listen to what the Imam says. There are two things that Allah did in the creation of the earth to prepare for the spreading of living things. Allah opened the heavens by sending down rain and he opened the earth by making things grow from it. Because when things grow from the earth, the earth opens, it splits. Seeds split, the earth opens, and, and grass and trees and vegetation grow forth from it. So this is the narration 
that is mentioned by Imam al-Baqir. And Imam al-Baqir actually mentions in that same hadith to the person who asked him about this ayah. And he says that the ayah doesn't mean that the earth and the heavens were stuck together. Meaning that it's not that the earth was in its, was a sphere and then the heavens, they were just glued together. The Imam saying it's not what, what the meaning of this verse is. And to corroborate this, if you look at the context, the flow of the verse, then Allah, what does he say? So Allah opened the heavens and the earth by sending down rain and vegetation grows. And then Allah says what at the end of the verse? وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءَ And we created and we made every living thing from water. So the, uh, the verse mentions that God opens the heavens. He opens the sky by sending down water. The water produces vegetation. And Allah mentions that don't think that only Plants need water. We made every living thing from water. Will they not then believe? So this is the, the explanation that uh, Imam al-Baqir gives. Now, and that's why we have to be very careful. You know, sometimes when we, when we look at verses, we automatically think that, oh, this ayah is confirming the Big Bang Theory. Now, the verse... Based on this hadith from Imam al-Baqir, this ayah is not talking about that. There is another ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Dhariyat, Surah 51, verse 47, where Allah says, wa wa inna We built the heavens, the skies, with our hands, with our power, you know, because... Uh, hands are used figuratively to mean power, and we are expanding them. We are expanding the heavens. Now, this verse seems to be, you, you might be able to use this verse to argue that there are some Quranic indications that the Big Bang theory do, is, is accurate because the universe is expanding, Allah is expanding it, and logically, if you reverse the hands of time, it will contract and it will reach a point of zero volume. So the point that I want to make, my dear brothers and sisters, is that when we read the Quran, we should be very careful before we make conclusive statements about what the verse is saying. We always have to make it a habit of referring to the Prophet, referring to the Ahlul Bayt. Because Imam al-Baqir specifically says in this verse, that do not think that this ayah is talking about the heavens and the earth being one mass. Allah is talking about something else. He's talking about opening the sky and opening the earth through water and through vegetation. And, and it makes sense because Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ so we have to be very cautious. You know, sometimes you might think that the ayah verse is obviously talking about the Big Bang Theory and that the universe was one mass and then it exploded into existence. Now that might be true, but you can't say that this ayah is talking about that, that occurrence, that incident, that cataclysmic event. Allah is not talking about that based on the hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Then Allah says in verse number 31. Actually, you know, before we continue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we created all living things from water. Everything, everything that has life uh, is the basis of it is water. And it's interesting, there's a hadith where someone asks the imam, he asks Imam al-Sadiq, someone asks the imam, what is the taste of water? 
right? You know, some things are sweet, some other, other things are salty, some are sour, others are bitter. What is the taste of water? What is water? If you were to try to explain to someone, what does water taste like? It's not sweet, it's not salty. I mean, of course, I'm not talking about salt water, but water, pure water. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, فَقَالَ الْإِمَامْ طَعْمُ الْمَاءِ طَعْمُ الْحَيَاةِ That the taste, that the taste of water is life. That water tastes like life. And then the Imam mentions this ayah. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ so, and, and you find that even, you know, scientists, you know, that's why NASA, you know, they get excited when they, when they see traces of water on Mars, because they know that living things need water. There can be no life if there is no water. Ayah number 31. وَجَعَلْنَا فِي الْأَرْضِ رَوَاسِيَ أَن تَمِيدَ بِهِمْ and we placed firm mountains in the earth, lest it shake beneath them. And we made wide tracks between them as paths, so perhaps they may be guided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he speaks about the earth specifically. And then Allah will go back to a discussion about the skies. Now about the earth. One of the blessings that Allah mentions is the fact that Allah has made the earth stable. And he has made the earth stable with mountains, right? Mountains actually have a, a, a geological function. You know, they're not just there just for scenery. You know, they're breathtaking, they're beautiful, they're majestic but they also serve a very practical function. And that is that they contain the, the convulsions of the earth. So, so think plate tectonics, earthquakes. So they're like pegs that prevent the earth from constantly shaking and constantly uh, experiencing those convulsions. Rawasiya, it refers to something that is very deep. It's, it's very firmly planted. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other verses he refers to mountains as pegs. So you know when you think of pegs like when you think of a tent to keep the tent in place you have to have pegs that you hammer into the ground. So the mountains are like pegs for the earth. They secure the earth. They provide stability. And that's something that, you know, we often take for granted. You, you don't appreciate the stability of the earth until you experience an earthquake, right? That's when you appreciate this ni'mah, the ni'mah of the stability of the earth. Because the earth is moving at a very rapid rate and we don't feel it. We don't feel the, uh, the speed of its rotation. So, and we don't, there, and there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, activity happening deep in the earth and if it wasn't for these mountains the earth would be inhospitable to us and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says and we made wide tracks between them as paths so perhaps you may be guided Fakh, fej. so Allah says وَجَعَلْنَا fiha," and we made in those mountains fijaja. Fedj, it literally means an opening, an opening. So when Allah created mountains, he didn't create them in a way where they are, they are just complete obstacles. They're not complete barriers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has created pathways. He has created these openings for us to be able to traverse mountains. So perhaps they may be guided. Now here, when Allah says perhaps they may, be, they, may be, they may be guided, it could mean two things, or it could mean both at the same time. 
perhaps they may be guided. It means that they can find their way through the mountains, through the mountain ranges. That these fijaj, these, these paths, these tracks serve as paths so they can find their way through the valleys and to get to the other side of the mountain. But from a spiritual perspective, it could also mean that when you reflect on the majestic mountains and how everything has been created with a purpose and with function, for, for, for purpose and function, it will guide you to God. Meaning that if you reflect and you ponder over my creation, you will be guided to me. You will be guided to me. Now, just as a, as a side thought, just as a, a personal reflection, you know, sometimes in life, my dear brothers and sisters, when we go through problems, we, you know, we think of our problems as mountains, right? Oftentimes, you know, we amplify our problems. We think that the, our problems are like mountains, impenetrable, overwhelming. But Allah in this ayah reminds us that even mountains, they're majestic, they're massive. I've created pathways that can get you through mountains. Similarly, Allah reminds us in Surah Al-Talaq, right? Because Talaq, you know, divorce is a very unpleasant time in people's lives. You know what happens? Couples argue, and if God forbid you have to go through divorce, you shouldn't lose hope. Right? You shouldn't think that this is the end of your life. You know, there's no way out. It's all doom and gloom. Because Allah says in Surah Al-Talaq, in ayah number three, Surah 65, ayah number three, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا That if you have taqwa, if you're God conscious, Allah will help you find the way out. So in the same way that Allah has created fijajan, subulan, in mountains, He has created pathways to get you through mountains, he has also created pathways to get you and I through our problems. And the way that we do that is we have taqwa. Allah promises, If you have taqwa, I will get you out of these problems. I will rescue you. That I will ensure that whatever happens to you is in your best interest. Ayah number 32. And we made the sky. So, so, so look at the, the, the beautiful flow of the verses. Ayah number 30, Allah spoke about the heavens and the earth. And ayah number 31, he spoke about the earth, stability of the earth. By creating mountains. Now Allah turns our attention to the sky, the sama. And he says, and we made the sky a preserved, a protective ceiling. A protected ceiling. Yet they turn away from its signs. Why does Allah call the sky a protected ceiling and and i'll speak about why the the word is mahfuva because mahfuva is a passive participle while the ayah you know technically should say hafiva that the the it's it's a protective ceiling but allah says it's a protected ceiling now let me first speak about how the sky, and, and this, is, this is a rhetorical uh, device in, uh, in the Arabic language where you use the, the passive participle when you intend on using the active participle because you want to draw the reader's attention to two different realities. And I'll explain. Now, number one, Allah is saying that the sky, I've made it a protective ceiling for you. It provides protection to the inhabitants of the earth. Now, and again, brothers and sisters, th these are all indications of a designer, of a creator, that the creator of the earth and the creator of the mountains has, has created these things 
to protect human beings, to protect living creatures. Now, how does the sky, how is the sky a protective ceiling? How does it protect us? The atmosphere has many levels. You know, from a scientific standpoint, the atmosphere has many levels. The lowest layer of the atmosphere is called the troposphere. And the troposphere is basically, if you wanted to measure it, it's from the ground, from ground level to about 10 kilometers upwards. So it extends upwards about 10 kilometers. Now, we human beings, we live in the troposphere. Weather, the weather that we experience happens at this layer. Clouds move around in the troposphere. And you know, incidentally, when we fly, when we fly in airplanes, airplanes typically fly right above the troposphere and at the bottom of the next layer of the atmosphere known as the stratosphere. Now the stratosphere, this is where the ozone is. And here we're gonna we're getting into this idea of this the atmosphere being a source of protection for the inhabitants of the earth. So the stratosphere is where the ozone is. And the ozone, as many of you know, you know, you, we learned this in elementary and middle school, even in high school, that the the ozone layer protects us from high energy UV that's emitted by the sun. And in the ozone layer, there are ozone molecules that absorb these high energy UV rays and they convert it to heat. So in the stratosphere, we have this, this protection from high energy UV. Then above the stratosphere, you have the, the mesosphere. And this is the layer that is actually extremely cold. And it protects us from meteorites, from meteors. So if it wasn't for this layer, we would be showered with meteorites. So in this layer, in the mesosphere, that's a protection from, uh, from meteors that come from uh, space. Then above that, and again, I'm not gonna go through each layer, but just to give you, you know, some of the layers. Then you have the thermosphere, which is above that. And this is where, this is the layer that protects us from high energy X-rays and UV radiation from, from the sun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, is telling us that not only are the mountains protecting you, but even the sky, and look at the power of God, that Allah is protecting us not even through a solid structure. It's not that there is an actual solid ceiling. Allah created gases that can protect us from, from these, uh, these dangerous elements, from meteorites. You know, Allah doesn't need a solid wall. Allah can use gas to create this, uh, this protective layer for us. Now, going back to the word mahfuva. Now, just to give you, so mahfuva is ism maf'ul, which is a, a passive participle. And then you have the ism fa'il, which is hafiva. So let me give you an example. So you, in, in Arabic, you have the word varib, the one who hit, varib, ism fa'il, the active participle. And then you have madhrub. Madhrub is the one who is hit, ism maf'ul. The sky protects us. So technically, the, the ayah should say, وَجَعَلْنَا السَّمَاءَ سَقْفًا حَافِظًا That it's, it is actively protecting us. But why, why does Allah say mahfuva? It's a protected ceiling. The reason is, is because Allah wants us to reflect and ask an, a more important question. So if you understand that the sky protects you, 
you should ask who is protecting the sky. And this is where you create that link between creation and the creator. So in the same way that you look at mountains and mountains are, are, are creating, are providing stability. They create stability for us. You should ask who created the mountains. You know, this, I, so we have to move away just from marveling at creation. We have to have adoration and we have to celebrate the praise of the creator. So don't just think about, don't just think about how the sky protects you. Think about who protects the sky, who preserves the sky, who created the system. But the problem is people turn away from, the, from its signs. Turning away, and this is a sign of arrogance, that one of the, well, the main reason why people know the truth and they reject it or they don't even want to consider it is because they're arrogant. Because they refuse to submit to a higher power. Because they want to be free, right? Because if they acknowledge that God exists, you know, in their minds, they're opening up a can of worms. Okay, if, he ex if I acknowledge that he exists, the next question that I have to ask is, why did he create me? He must have created me for a purpose. And then I have to get into the, the do's and don'ts. And I want to be free. So it's about the nafs. It's about this refusal to, to control. It's about following desires. It's about arrogance. It's a moral problem. They turn away. Verse number 33. It is he who created the night and the day. Imagine it was only day, only nighttime. We would freeze. Imagine it was only day. There was no, there was no night. The earth would, would burn. Plants, animals would not be able to survive. And he created... The sun and the moon, and this is this part is truly amazing. <inaudible> the sun and the moon and all celestial bodies are swimming. They are each swimming in an orbit. Yasbahun. <inaudible> now, before I speak about why the word yasbahun <inaudible> is used, why does Allah mention night? And then he mentions day. Why not day and night? Allah knows best, but if you remember when we were speaking about the angels earlier in the, the surah, Allah, he described the angels as you said, that angels praise God night and day. And Allah seems to be maintaining this uh, this consistency in the order. Now you would think that after mentioning night and day, Allah would have mentioned moon and then sun, but Allah mentioned sun first and then moon. I didn't find anything specifically in the, the tafasir, but it seems that Allah is saying that either way, it doesn't matter. Allah is the creator of the sun and the moon. It doesn't matter what order you put it in. He's the creator of both and all. And then the, the, the part of the ayah that I want to bring your attention to is the part where he says each, the sun and the moon, these celestial bodies are swimming in orbit. Fi falakin yasbahun. Falak, you know, it's to go in a circular motion and and that's why, you know, you have uh, the word fulk. Fulk means ship. Because ships usually, they go in these circular routes. They go to a, a, a port and they, they, then they return. So it's a type of circular route. Fi falakin yasbahun. Subhanallah. This yasbahun is a very interesting verb. Yasbahun means to swim. Why would Allah use the verb yasbahun when he speaks about the sun and the moon and all celestial bodies for that matter? When you swim, and I want you to pay attention to this, when we swim, my dear brothers and sisters, 
what do our bodies do to the water? When we submerge ourselves, when we put our bodies in the water, when we swim, our bodies create a disturbance in the water. You know what? We create a disturbance in the water and we create ripples. We create waves because ripples are essentially waves. When we swim, we create a disturbance in the water. We create ripples. We create waves. Interestingly, Allah uses the same verb when he speaks about the motion of the sun and the moon. Because the sun and the moon, when they move, they also create ripples. They create waves. But they create a specific type of wave called gravitational waves. Right? They create a disturbance in the space-time curvature. So some Muslim scientists, when they, when they read these verses, they immediately thought about gravitational waves. Again, Allah knows best, but this is you know, definitely something interesting uh, to, uh, to consider. So in the same way, we create a disturbance in water. We create waves when we swim. The sun and the moon, they also create uh, gravitational uh, waves.